Well, it looks as though it's uh, election time uh, in Brindisi. But the fountains are still going. And it's very pleasant here. But we must um, make our way to the railway station now for our day in Lecce. Just at the top of the road there. Lecce has been described as the most beautiful town in southern Italy. We're approaching it through the olive groves and vineyards and whatnot on our way. And fortunately, as usual, we're on time because we don't wish to be late for our reception committee. Thank you, very nice. Now, Lecce is Baroque. In fact, Lecce is Southern Baroque. Let's make our way first over to the main square, the Piazza San Toronzo. Now there we can see a column that used to be in Brindisi. It fell down and lay there for a hundred years. And Lecce say that they bought it. Well, I don't know. Now one day in 1901 a workman was digging in the square and discovered a Roman amphitheatre, half of which we can see here. The other half is under that road to the right and under this church, which uh, is the church of uh, Santa Maria della Grazia. Southern Baroque, I understand, is not like the chilly, pompous Baroque of a room, but a sunny, frivolous style which Lecce created for itself. There you can see the curls round the columns and the decorations. That's Baroque. Now if we come out of the church and walk down the side, we shall be under the walls of the castle. And it sounds like there's another fountain indeed, but Lecce has fountains as well as Brindisi. Apart from those two up there, the rest of it looks as though it might be the pipes from the organ that was replaced by that new one in that church. And yes, the market. And alongside the castle, the post office. Lunch break in the park. And very nice too. Now, these busts that you can see are not of politicians and statesmen. They're mainly of uh, artists, musicians, writers. Um, there seems to be plenty of water to wash bikes with as well. Now to lunch, I just walk back across the road through the council offices and we come to the Baroque church in Lecce, Santa Croce. The bottom half there is fairly restrained Renaissance, but the rest of it, the brothers Zimbalo, two local architects, really let themselves go. Look at the decoration there. Now look at these uh, figures under the corbel here. We've got the she-wolf of uh, Romulus and Remus, we've got dragons, we've got a Turk, an African, a German.
and next door adjoining is the Palazzo del Governo or the council offices which used to be a convent. We we'll now make our way through the streets past another church to the Porta di Napoli. Now on the other side of this arch uh, the Emperor Charles V erected this with the double eagle up there and an inscription just to let everybody know who after the revolt of 1548 which he put down just to let them know who was in charge that monument is to Ferdinand I and we've worked round the outside of the city wall to Porto Rudai inside which we can find San Giovanni Battista which is also known as the Rosario. This was another work, the last work of Zimbolo. The advantage of the local sandstone is that it's nicely coloured, easy to work and uh, after some time in situ becomes harder and harder. Now there's Victor Emmanuel II who's having a look at Santa Chiara. Inside you'll notice that the nave is elliptical or oval shaped. Now that's that for decoration. Ornament. There you go. The bell tower of the cathedral, about 70 metres high, can be seen from practically anywhere. Looks like that's some more local sandstone going up somewhere. Now there's the top of the bell tower which can be seen from here. It can be seen from the square that we were in. It can be seen from here and here. The cathedral is in a little square which can only be entered by one entrance. And when the Zimbalo brothers, yes them again, rebuilt the cathedral. They added this facade to the side of the cathedral because that's what you saw as you entered the square. The real front of the cathedral is to the right there. And uh, it just seemed quite restrained really. Now, if you're going to get married in Italy, which does seem to be quite a popular pastime, it's uh, de rigueur to have a video made. And I'm guessing that these two here are either about to be married or have recently been married and we're taking some background shots. Now just a short walk down this little alleyway brings us to San Matteo one of the latest of the Baroque churches. You, as you can see the top half is concave, the lower half convex and uh, inside we can see the elliptical nave. Now to return to the 11th century and the progress of the Normans, by 1053 the power of the Normans had grown to such an extent that the Pope, Leo IX, sent a force to deal with them. This force was defeated by the Normans at Civitate. In 1071 the Normans captured Bari, thus bringing to an end Byzantine administration in Italy. 
Now I've just got back to Brindisi in time to see, or at least hear, half of the Italian Navy going on shore leave. So I'm better one now. Sat here now one of the palm trees trying to cool off. Yeah, and this is what you call a street. <laughs> In 1072, the Normans took Palermo in Sicily from the Saracens, and by 1091, Normans ruled the whole of Sicily and the southern half of Italy. This area, which through the following centuries, and through such names as the Kingdom of Naples or the Kingdom of the Two Sicilies, was governed separately from the rest of Italy until the unification in the 19th century. Ah, now here's a, a little gem. This 13th century church, Santa Maria del Casale, is right on the edge of the airport, which is also a military base, and behind that wall is an armoured car lurking. Built in two shades of sandstone. It's quite near the football ground, as you will hear. It's now six o'clock Sunday evening, it's still very warm, although there's a pleasant breeze. And inside we have a straightforward barn type building. Apart from the modern altarpiece here, it must be very much as built in the 13th century. The walls are covered with uh, these frescoes, some on several levels by the look of it, which are Byzantine in style. Our researchers indicate that this church was used by the convocation which was called by Clement V to judge the Knights Templar and were consequently abolished in 1312. This painting is the Tree of the Cross. Ah, I wonder if uh, the author of the Da Vinci Code has uh, studied these symbols. Now one wall is entirely covered by a fresco on uh, four levels entitled, here it is, The Last Judgment, and it's by Rinaldo of Taranto. That big red thing there is the devil. A very nice little church. And even I have noticed the smell of all these flowers.
next door, the cloister, was built between 1635 and 1638. Just to explain that uh, we shall see Tancred's fountain shortly, and Tancred was the grandson of Roger II, King of Sicily. He was crowned king in 1190. Well, Fountain. Have a job watering his horses here today. He was crown king on the death of William II. Uh, unfortunately, the crown was also claimed by Constance, who was William II's aunt and who had married Henry VI, Holy Roman Emperor. On the death of Tancred in 1194, Henry deposed Tancred's infant son William III and the Hohenstaufens took over.